Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to Welcome, everyone, say. to episode number 68 of a series of episodes that we're calling Leading Others to Christ. Those of you who have been listening and watching, uh, you know that these episodes are going to be focused on the subject of evangelism. Uh, we have a lot of goals with, uh, with this podcast, but one of them is to stir us up, as the Hebrew writer said, to stir us up to love and good works, but especially in the area of reaching our family or friends or neighbors with the gospel of Christ. My name is Dan Barker, and I preach for the Creekside Church of Christ in Franklin, Indiana. Uh, for those of you who don't know where Franklin is, it's about 20 miles south of uh, downtown Indianapolis, Indiana. Those of you that know me, and I've said this, I think, on every episode, but those of you that know me know that I'm passionate about our subject today of evangelism. And I have been ever since I obeyed the gospel when I was 21 years old in Owensboro, Kentucky. And it really, ever since then, I've tried to read everything I could get my hands on, talk to anybody that I could uh, to learn more about this. And uh, I want to use some Bible phrases to have always been striving to teach others, uh, to sow the seed, to be a fisher, to learn how to be a fisher of men, obviously, and women, to make disciples, to persuade men and women, and to teach others to teach. And, and I started using this, this passage early on, and I'm going to continue it uh, because I love it, what Paul was talking to Timothy about in 2 Timothy 2.2 2, when he told him, the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, obviously, and women who will be able to teach others also. And then later in the same chapter, he's encouraging uh, Timothy to be useful for the master. And I've always just really liked that because I want to be useful for the master. So back when all the COVID nonsense hit, you know, Matt Maldon and I were talking about doing a podcast, and uh, here we are, 68 uh, episodes later, but we wanted to try to find out who's doing this work. The men and the women, uh, preachers, elders, deacons, members, uh, uh, who they are, where they are, how they're doing their work, how they're setting up studies, uh, just all the things that they're doing, and it's real. it's been fascinating. We've learned so much, and uh, and we're continuing today, and we're so excited today to have someone with us that we're going to talk about some things that are a little bit different uh, for us than what we've heard before. But we have Daryl Townsend with us today. Welcome, Daryl. Thanks, Dan. It's good to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Appreciate you taking the time today to do this. Uh, I want to encourage you, not if you're driving, but, uh, but uh, if you're at home watching this, uh, to get out your notepad and take some notes because... Uh, I know you're going to learn some things today from Daryl that uh, that you're going to want to retain. Um, Daryl, we really do appreciate you taking the time. And uh, uh, I had a chance to uh, uh, was in Birmingham last week, two weeks ago, whatever it is. And I, I got a chance to meet uh, two of your boys. And that was special. Uh, didn't get a chance to talk to them very long, but uh, really nice, uh, really nice kids. And uh so thanks for suggesting that we talk there, and I'm, I'm glad you suggested that. But um, so what we like to do, Daryl, uh, is uh, start out with what I call the old elevator pitch or the short bio. If you would uh, tell everyone that's watching and listening a little bit about Daryl, where you were born, how old you were when you became a Christian, uh, congregation that you're working with now and let's just start out with there if you would so okay. floor is, the floor is yours all right I grew up in Jacksonville I, I grew up in the pews my dad was an elder for about 20 years at the Lakeshore congregation in uh, west side of Jacksonville so where I live now is Middleburg which is just south of Jacksonville about 20 to 30 miles um, so I grew up uh, became a Christian as a teenager the youngest of five boys. So I was the baby and some say I was spoiled, although I say that's not true. Uh, but uh, so and went to the University of Florida for college uh, and majored in dairy science. So I worked in the dairy industry for about 20 years. So um, 
I got married right out of my first year in college. My wife was a year behind me, so we've been married now 42 years. Um, she helped put me through school, got out, went to work at a dairy in Jacksville, started worshiping at a congregation on the other side of town called the South Jacksville Church of Christ, where Harold Dowdy preached. And Harold really opened my mind up for the first time to the idea of what we typically call personal evangelism, reaching out, finding people to study the Bible with. <laughs> And so he was a big influence on me early on. And there were a lot of brethren in that congregation that kind of bought into that at the time. And so I can remember getting the, the Jules uh, Miller film strips and sitting down with employees of mine at the dairy and going through those and trying to stay awake through them, waiting for the tone to sound on the cassette tape. So <laughs> uh, I've come a long way since then. But that kind of introduced me. And, and you've said this many times on the podcast about, once you get a flavor for that, and once you see somebody uh, come to know Christ and, and, and want to change their lives and they're converted to Christ, it, it does something to you. And so it feed, it, you want to feed that once you've felt it and seen it and experienced it. So uh, through ended up moving, went to work in another dairy, ended up moving to Middleburg about 32 years ago, started worshiping at the Middleburg congregation. And the evangelist at that time was Rick Billingsley. And I think you've interviewed Rick. I have, yes. And Rick just had such a zeal for uh, evangelism. He had such a personality. We always used to say Rick could get a Bible study with a pine tree if you give him long enough to talk to him. <laughs> and uh, so he was very evangelistic. They were teaching. And so I, I sat in with Rick. He uses the four lesson approach and kind of learned to do that with him and got to experience that and kind of that fed fed in me. And so uh, through the years, I was always involved. I would do Bible studies with people as I had opportunity, but I was working in the dairy business, either managing large dairies in Florida or doing consulting. And then uh, in 2003, um, I just more and more was growing restless and uh, lost my love for the dairy business and felt like I could do more for the kingdom. Um, I just felt like there's more that I could do, something in life that was going to be more eternal than uh, taking care of cows. It was a great profession, provided for my family, but I thought there was more. And so at that time, the evangelist we had at that time, Jeff Harward, uh, stepped away, and uh, I asked the congregation to consider me to preach. And so I started preaching about that time, about 2000, into 2003, beginning of 2004. After I started preaching a little while, a former member had a son who's, who hung out at our house a lot with my boys growing up and my daughter, um, and uh, he was in jail, and she asked if I would go see him, and so I went and, for the first time ever, went and made a visit to jail. Uh, to do that, you have to talk to the chaplain to arrange things and whatnot, and so I mentioned to the chaplain, I said, hey, if you ever need a class taught or something, let me know. I'd be open to do it. I was just, you know, looking for opportunities like you've talked about so much. And so he called me a couple months later and they had a, a study for juvenile offenders that were being tried as adults. So these were all under 18 and they all had done crimes, murder, uh, rape, one of them, uh, serious capital crimes that they were gonna be tried as adults. Uh, the youngest was 16, 16 and 17, I think most of them. One of those young men wanted to obey the gospel and they didn't have a baptistry there. So he'd gotten sentenced to in Florida. If you're sentenced to more than a year, you go to state prison. And so he was sent to the reception center where the men in this part of Florida go to to wait to be sent out to the prisons. They classify them and do some things. I met a brother there uh, that had worked with some institutional congregations for many years doing prison work. And I just uh, asked him about, well, what do you do? And he said, well, one of the things I do is I do these one-on-one -on -one meetings. So I said, can I sit in with you and just see what it's like? So we baptized this young man. And then I had a chance to sit in with this brother, Gary Wider. Uh, and he, the first guy we talked to was a guy, and we started talking. He was from Jacksonville. I was from Jacksonville. Grew up on the same side of town. Anyway, I'd gone to junior high school with a guy. Wow. And didn't even recognize him. And uh so uh, we got to talking and how his life just got off track. He got involved in drugs and this was the second time in prison. And, and I don't know, I just really felt like, wow, this is something that would be good to do. They're, they need people. They were begging for people to come in and teach the Bible. So that kind of started. So while I was 
preaching, uh, myself and uh, a brother that was also working with us at the time, Denny Freeman, started uh, getting involved in the, in the prison there at the Reception Medical Center about an hour away, and then found out about a closer prison that was the first faith-based prison in the state, Laudy Correctional, and it's only about 30 minutes from the house. Went there and they had a mentoring program where a denomination was coming in and meeting with guys in small groups. So I started sitting in with them and had eventually got my own group of guys. And eventually we found there's probably five or six of us from the church men that were willing to do it. And we started our own mentoring group and just started meeting with men and teaching. Well, we started teaching the gospel and having men that wanted to obey the gospel. And we baptized, I think that first year, about 60 guys. And uh, about so how many? That we need to do something. We need to have a way for these men to worship in spirit and truth. And so they allowed us to start doing a Sunday service. So we've been doing a Sunday service at Lottie Correctional now since uh, 2005. Every Sunday afternoon at one o'clock. So we finish with our services and a few of us or one or two of us go to Lottie and, and do a service there with the men. So then it just grew. And then I eventually, a couple of years later, stepped away. Uh, wanted to do it full time, started a not for profit called Off the Chain Ministries because I wanted to also work with men when they got out. So the next year we bought our first place, the tran what we call a transition house, to start working with men that we had converted while they were in prison to help them get started coming out. And so that's we've got two transition houses now. We can hold up to nine men. Um, it's so I, I get supported from some congregations directly to me and then individuals all across the brotherhood uh, help support the, the work through the nonprofit. Wow. <clears throat> now that's a, that's a short bio. That's a lot of stuff there. That's all. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding you, but wow. Just to uh, try to go back. And uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I've asked a lot of people and you mentioned two people there, uh, I always ask people, did you have a mentor, you know, or mentors? And you said uh, Harold Dowdy and, and Rick Billingsley. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it just, just to have people like that in our lives, it, how do you, how can, how can you even explain that, right? Of how important they were and Man. how motivational they were, right? Yeah. And, and look, Harold Dowdy, you know, loving people, I, I, you know, I never really thought about, I don't know how, but I never thought about it. You need to be teaching the gospel to people. And so to see men like that uh, and, and love it and, 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 and Harold was big about talking to us, say it doesn't just need to be me, me doing it. Everybody needs to be doing this. So as a young man, you know, I was 21 when I graduated from college and started worshiping there. So as a 21 year old man, I was that, that had a huge impression on me. And I, I'm like, this is something we need to be doing. And, and, I knew people at the dairy that that live there that I that and I just started asking people, would you be willing to sit down and study the Bible? And it's infectious, but you need to be. It's 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 sad that we don't just pick that up on our own, but to see somebody doing it, and then to see Rick and, and Rick's style and how he could relate to people, um, just you know, had a big impression on my life. Well. Um... Yeah, it's it, you have to be around those people and the ones that aren't haven't been around them. They don't know what they've been missing. And it's one of the reasons why we started this podcast was that and you've heard you've listened enough of them now that uh, unfortunately, there's, you know, in some congregations, uh, they're closing their doors. Uh, other congregations are shrinking, uh, it, but, you know, as people move away or die off and there's no new people being brought to Christ in, in the community. And it's like. It's like, well, what has happened here? Why, you know, uh, the people that, that are not listening to the Harold Dowdy's uh, or didn't listen to him or, or right. not listen to Rick Billingsley or whomever. But uh, I, for some reason, in some places, it, it's just uh, it's either been taught and the people didn't get it or it hasn't been taught or it was implied that, well, you're the preacher, uh, Daryl, you, you've got to do this or, you know. Right. And like Harold said, no, it's not just me. It's all of us are supposed to be involved. And that's one of the things we're trying to do is to say, hey, I'm responsible here. Uh, and if I don't do it, I'm going to have blood on my hands. And that's not going to be a very comfortable scene at judgment if mm -hmm. I don't have, you know, if I, I can't uh, 
can't show and demonstrate that I had done the Lord's work. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I have to, before I forget, in Owensboro one summer, here's my connection to your dairy story, right? <laughs> I worked for Velvet Ice Cream, uh, Velvet Milk Company. And they had me cleaning. You remember those tall cans that the milk would come in? Yeah, yeah. I cleaned that <laughs> <laughs> and that machine, I used to clean those. So you know, uh, you know how what a what a fun job that was. Yes, uh, it is. So that's my connection to you on the uh, the dairy business. But that's okay. it. Um, you know, uh, another question that that I typically ask people, and you covered that as well. But uh, and I appreciate you telling the, the story about the dairy. And uh, you know, I ask people, well, why are you doing what you're doing? And you've touched on it a little bit, but let's go a little bit deeper with it. Of all the, I mean, you could still be in the dairy business, right? Yes. Uh, and and uh, but you, at that point where you decided to, uh, I think you said 2003, you decided, and I'm sure that was through much uh, prayer and and thought of uh, making a change there. But let, let's go over that again. Why did you do that? Yeah, it's it's really hard uh, because. The last year or so, the, the work just got really hard and that my heart wasn't in it like it had been. I was, you know, coming out of college, very motivated to be the best dairy in the state and win awards and all that stuff. And then I did consulting for 10 years and then went back to managing a large dairy. And I was excited about getting my hands back on it. And, and then I don't know, the, the joy went out of it. And I just kept thinking to myself, I, I know I can do something more than this to affect the lives of people. Um, so I've, I've always, I guess, been kind of a people person that the, when I was consulting, we, we work very closely with the clients. We develop close relationships, even in those, in that business. And I just feel like I'm not doing enough that I could be doing to help people and change their lives. And so uh, it just would bother me. And I, I pray about it and, and, and I'm one of these people, you know, I, I pretty much have to have a door slammed in my face before I can move on to something else. Well, at the end of that year, the guy I worked for was in the 60s and he decided he was going to shut the dairy down. So at the same time he was shutting the dairy down, I was faced with, am I going to have to move to get another job? I had other opportunities, but and at the same time, there was a chance to preach at the congregation. So, you know, providentially looking back, you see it, you don't know for sure, but I just looked at it as God's given me an opportunity. All I got to do is step through the door and do it. So I did. Well, and thank God that you did. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's like a lot of things in life. You can't, uh, until you've done it, it's hard to relate, but most of us can't relate to doing what you're doing right now every day. And the, the stories that you hear every day, right? The, uh, the, the stories that you've heard, the sad stories, the, the broken homes, the broken promises, the uh, bad decisions, the consequences that go with that. Um, and uh, I, I told a fella earlier that we were interviewing, and I'm, I'm going to suggest this to you if you hadn't thought about it. You ought to write a book. You ought, you ought to start <laughs> writing a journal. Seriously. Of all the things, and you don't have to use their names, obviously, but just the stories that you're hearing, uh, and uh, uh, and you know, uh, talk about emotional uh, stories. Certainly, they would be. But usually, I ask everybody, and I know you're going to have several here, but I call it a conversion story. Would you mind sharing one with us? And it could be more than one, but one that comes to mind that you'd like to share with uh, those that are listening. Yeah, so because you ask this every time. So every time when I'm watching the podcast, I think about that, too. And it's really hard for me to uh, because in the prison, the conversion is not the big thing. And I understand how I mean that. It's amazing when men that are in prison have done terrible things, decide they need to they need to come to have a relationship with Jesus and die with him. But it's not, uh, 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 you know, like the events that lead up to that, like you have with people in the free world. Like this past year, our neighbors, a young couple that were living together next door, and both in the Navy, uh, became Christians. They were, we have a pond. They were baptized in our pond in the front yard. So that, that was a, a neat story, how that interacted and how we got to know them and, 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 and everything. But in the prison, it's the same story every time. You show up to the prison, you meet somebody. 
you ask them to, if they're interested in talking. So we do what we call one-on-ones where guys just sign up. And so what I did all day today at the prison is while I was there is I had three guys this morning and three guys this afternoon. And they just sign up and like being a doctor's, I sit in a room and they just come in one right after the other and we study together or counsel or whatever. So that part, so the conversion story in my mind is when they get out of prison to see their life because we've had so many men. I mean, you know, I don't want to paint this picture that whenever somebody new comes into the prison with me, they're just like, their eyes are big as saucers. And it's like, this is the greatest thing in the world. There's 50 men in the chapel. They're singing, they're, you know, praising God. It's great. This is the most wonderful work. And I just shake my head because I'm like, well, this isn't real. What's real is when they get out. Right. And we, most of the men that we work with fail. I mean, there's just, I can tell you, spend all day just telling you the stories of failures because those are the ones that have broken my heart more and more than one time. But so the story of success is uh, Brent Lewis. I don't know if you know Brent, but he wrote a book uh, sure. about conversion stories and uh, was blind, but now I see is the name. Yes. Of and in it, he wrote the story about one of the guys that we converted while in prison, a guy named Paul Gregory. And Paul has spoken at some congregations but real quick, because it, it could take a long time, but I'm looking at a note right now in my office while I talk to you, and it says, and I'll probably cry if I read it, thank you for loving me and believing that God had a plan for me. I love you, Paul. And uh, so Paul was a guy that we were told to stay away from while he was in prison. Uh, he's one of these shyster kind of uh, always had a deal going on, shaker and a mover in the prison. <laughs> Well, when I known him at first, I lost touch with him for a few years. And then at Lottie, where we have this service, he showed up one day and I remembered him and he wanted to sit down and talk with me. And during that time, Paul had reevaluated his life and uh, we studied. He became a Christian, uh, not just with me, but with some of the other men that would come in with us. And, uh, you know, I said, look, people told me you're you're the biggest manipulator they've ever known. And I'll just tell you, if you don't change that, you're not going to make it. And so over the next couple of years, he was faithful, came to everything. So he came to our transition program and we even started up a lawn business and let Paul run it to try to help employ guys when they got out. Well, he ended up through another brother, Steve Truby, who uh, is down at the court congregation down uh, near Plant City. Steve had just gotten interested in my work and wanted to come and go into the prisons and stuff. Well, he entered, he met Paul one day. Well, his he had a stepdaughter who had two children whose husband had left her uh, named Angie. And I, he says, I need to meet Angie, meet Paul. And I said, no, you don't. We ain't doing this. This is too soon, blah, blah, blah. You know, because I'd already had bad things happen already by this time in the prison work that I, I my naivete had gone away. Right. Anyway, they didn't listen to me. They introduced her to Paul. They fall in love. They get married. And despite me, get married on my birthday. Okay. <laughs> And I always say, you know, I always blame him. I said, you did that just to spite me. So he moves down there uh, to live to live down there. He marries her and with her two daughters. And it's just a few, and I don't, I don't get the dates right, but it was two or three years later that she begins to have headaches. They go to the emergency room. She's got a brain tumor. Oh. <clears throat> uh, very serious. They do surgery. It seems to be successful. She gets better for a while. It comes back. They have to do surgery again. Uh, within about two years, she passed away. During that time, Paul, uh, the, the father of the girls, is not involved in their life. And Angie asked Paul to adopt the girls. Wow. And Paul adopts the girls. Wow. And so uh, his oldest daughter is attending Florida College right now. He's been Paul's been out now for about 10 years, eight years, something like that. And so the story of God's providence, he's raised those girls now since Angie's been dead now, maybe four years. Um, he's raised those girls, continue to be faithful to Christ. Uh, one daughter going to, to get ready to graduate, the youngest, I think, this year from high school, the, the oldest daughter finishing her second year at FC. And, uh, you know, so, so with all the heartache, when things get bad, uh, you just look at that note and you think about Paul. And there's there's other men like that that we've had success with that are still serving Christ. And he's like, man, that was worth everything. And yeah. 
so he, he, he was there in those girls' lives and has become a father to them. They love him uh, all because this guy, you know, somebody supported me so I could go into the prison and talk to him about Christ. And I just, you know, just blows my mind. Well, it, it is. And it's, uh, uh, this came up in the first uh, interview that we did with uh, Benjamin Lee in uh, What If. And uh, you've heard me talk about it probably in some of the interviews. And in fact, that's our theme this year where I preach at our, our meeting that we're doing. Uh, and it's like, what if? What if you hadn't been there in the prison? What if you had not met Paul? What if he had not met her? Yeah. What if What if she hadn't died? What if he hadn't adopted the kid? You know, it just, it goes on and on. And you look back at this and go, this, you can't make this up. Oh, it's amazing. No. Yeah, the, 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 the providence of God and the, the power of the gospel. And it's, uh, no, that's just, uh, and like you said earlier, it once you're involved in, in situations like this, it's so contagious. Uh, and you just go, I, I just, I have to do more of this. I have to, there's other people out there or how many more people are there? And I think it's just fascinating what you're doing, Daryl, with all the, and, and you have to keep, what, what I mean with this is that, you, you can't tell, you don't have any control over what they're going to do after the fact. And like you say, once they get out. Uh, and the, But the importance of teaching the, the, what repentance really is all about, what change is all about, uh, that's that's the big thing. But that's with everybody. Whether, you don't have to be in prison. To, but how many people obey the gospel, you know, and they end up after the fact, it's like they just got wet. They didn't really understand or didn't follow through or didn't make changes for whatever reason. And uh, Jesus told us it was going to be like that, too, that people would do that. But, you know, it's just but I'm just so proud of what you're doing and uh, just want to commend you to keep doing this. And and uh, what was the name of the group again was the off the chain ministry? That's my not for profit. Yes, sir. Yeah. I wanted to okay. mention that again for the ones that maybe would be interested in helping with that. And uh, it, that's, was, you know, the, it was clear after working in the prison, it's it's great to go in and teach the gospel and convert people, but what are they going to do when they get out? These men have never lived in general. Now, the other thing is interesting is you meet members of the church in prison all the time, which is, was a shock to me, you know? So there, there are several men that I, that I see or visit that grew up in, in a congregation <clears throat> somewhere and yeah. fell away and got into sin. So there's a real need to, to see a man that for uh, one time, a guy had been 10 years since he'd had a chance to take the Lord's Supper with brethren. And we came in wow. one Sunday and to see and, and it made you more how we don't appreciate that when it's taken away from you, you know, and uh, then to be able to sit there with men of like faith and partake in the death and the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, it's a stunning thing when it's taken well, away. Yeah, how emotional that would have been just to be yeah. there with him with uh but yeah, just people don't think about that. What do you mean he was a member of the church and he's in jail, you know, or he's in prison? Right. But people make mistakes and we have to, you know, and they need help too. Uh, wow, we, we could just, Matt's already given me the signal of five times. That I know we've talked about you. You think these need to be longer. And I think you're, okay. with this one, maybe we do you again. But uh, <laughs> uh, you heard me do this too. At one thing, let's say that somebody's listening and watching and they, Maybe they, uh, uh, and I got to tell you a story I just remembered. Uh, let me do, I'll just do that right now. I was studying with a guy, that was, this was in uh, Whitesville, Kentucky. This is a long time ago, and you made me think of this. And while we were in the study, we were talking about sin. We were talking about uh, where the lost are going to spend eternity. And, and he said, uh, I want to ask you a question. I said, uh, sure. What, what's the question? And he said, uh, I killed a guy. and uh, can I still go to heaven? And I hate to say this, but I was younger and I went, yeah, right. He went, no, no, I really did. And I spent, I think he said 26, 27 years in prison wow. uh, for what he had done. And uh, he was out and he said, uh, can I still go to heaven? And we, sh I said, absolutely, but you're going to have to understand how that's all going to occur. You're going to have to understand what we're going through, what we're studying here. Well, he ended up obeying the gospel, but that was the first time I'd ever, ever had anybody say something like that to me. Wow. And uh, so, uh, but yeah, thank you for, for what you're doing. But let's say the one thing, 
somebody's watching and listening and they say, I, you know what? There's a prison close to here. There's people that, you know, you're making me think. Or I used to do things like this and for whatever reason, I've gotten cold or I've, I just, I, I, I need to get on fire again. I know there's more than one thing, but what would you say somebody needs to do or learn how to do to lead others to Christ? Yeah, so I, I try not to uh, guilt people into prison work. Yes. What I say is you need to be in kingdom work. And so if you're so busy teaching the gospel to your neighbors and there's enough Bible studies, then, hey, I probably wouldn't go into a prison either. Uh, but if you're not that busy, then it's just another way to find the lost. And I'm not saying it's better. They're more deserving, less deserving. It's just an opportunity. And I think if we're if you're going to look for opportunities to serve and and teach the gospel, and if you can't find any, then there's probably a prison near you, and you can probably go in there. And I guarantee you, there'll be people there that will come and sit in the class when you teach. And it's like I call it, it's like you know, I, I'm a dove, used to hunt dove as a young man, and and if you've ever you know shot birds on a baited field, I kind of feel like prisons like that are shooting fish in a barrel. And so it doesn't have to be prison work. You interviewed so many people and they're doing, they're just busy. You're busy. And so it's not like, well, you're not doing prison work. You're not doing the Lord's work. No, just do the Lord's work, whatever it is. But I think we, sh we have ignored the prisons for a long time, especially among the more conservative congregations of God's people. And generally denominations have just dominated in the prisons. And I think we need to bring the truth in there because I think most of the, the groups that go in there, all they have to offer is a lie. And yeah. it's not the truth. And men need to hear the truth about repentance, about the Bible being the sole authority for their lives. And I, and I think that's the only hope that they have. And that, so I, I say just be busy in the kingdom. That's the one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the, the phrase kingdom work because that's what it is. Uh, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, uh, Daryl, is there, a, is there a, would you be willing to share a contact information where they could talk to you if they wanted to? Sure. My email address is my first name, Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L, Town, T-O-W-N, the last four of my last name, or the first four letters of my last name, DarylTown at AOL.com. And then offthechainministries.org, I mean, dot .com is our uh, web website. Okay. I do a quarterly report that we post on there. Um, if anybody would like to get that, they can just email me. I can put them on the mailing list. Okay. It just kind of gives them an idea of what the work's going on and doing. Well, brother, I uh, enjoyed talking to you a couple of times on the phone. And uh, Thank you, obviously you're another one. Uh, I, I've told this, I need to figure out what the percentage is. Probably 80% of the people I've interviewed, I've never met them in person. And, uh, and, uh, you know, years ago, if somebody said something like that to me, I would have gone, there's no way. How could that ever happen? But with technology, right? The yeah. Lord willing, one of these days we can meet. I would I would Amen. love that. And uh, thanks for what you do. Like I said, I've, I've gone back and listened to so many of these. And it's been very encouraging. And I just, I, you know, I hope you'll keep doing it. Um, the, 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 the brethren in, in Ocala, the central congregation, used to do a thing before the lectures the Saturday before the lectures, and they do an evangelism kind of seminar. And Colton Williamson at that time would just find men like you've kind of done, men that are out doing the work and get them all together and, and let them talk and just listen. And that's so encouraging. So I feel like I'm kind of getting that through these Zoom meetings that you're doing uh, and hearing about men's work. And it's very encouraging. Well, we need to be encouraged. We need to be motivated. We need to to know that I'm not the only one out here trying to work and do this. You know, I'm not in this by myself and we all need, we all need to be lifted up that way. So, but again, thank you so much. And uh, uh, really do appreciate you and, and everything that you're doing. Uh, heard nothing but good things about you from the Vestavia congregation and they're proud of what you're doing and uh, as well. So uh, thank you again for taking the time today, Daryl, to, uh, to, to meet with us. Thank you, brother. Okay, thank you. There are who pray, melt my heart and fill my life. Give me one soul today.